Good evening, everyone. I declare the meeting open. I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional lands of the Kabi Kabi people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I note that everyone is in attendance. I would like to also welcome attendees in our gallery. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, I'd just like to remind you that um, please, at all times, don't interject and just listen and um, no, no calling out. Um, we've, we've had some occurrences before where that's happened and there's points of order being called. We appreciate there is strong emotion in the room, uh, but I just ask that you respectfully listen. And so thank you all very much for being here. We appreciate your attendance and, and your input and your interest. Uh, can I have a mover for the confirmation of the minutes of the ordinary meeting? Thank Move you, Councillor Wilkie. Seconder, thank you, Councillor Finzel. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Alinda, thank you. There are no mayoral minutes. Does anyone have any petitions? Councillor Finzel? Yes, I have a position to, pre uh, to present to the council. It's for the Noosa Council regarding the proposed Lake Denella foreshore management plan. Uh, the undersigned request that Council delay any consideration of the proposed Lake Denella foreshore management plan until Council have considered the impending report of NICA's study on Lake Denella and its recommendations for environmental management of the foreshore. Secondly, Council have completed the preparation of the 22-23 budget and three, Council have consulted with representative of the impacted landowners regarding issues of security and safety as well as other impacts such as noise. Thank you. I may note that these are not necessarily my personal views, but I am representing this to the CEO on behalf of the people. Can I have a second for that, please? Councillor Lawrence. Okay. All in favour? Okay. Carried unanimously. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Councillor Stockwell, believe you have a petition. I have a petition. It's signed by 17 people um, from Koran, and the uh, the thrust of the petition is that they seek the support for proposals for longer term sustainable and resilient economic growth for Koran via improved infrastructure. And this is something that came out of our coffee chats on Friday where uh, one of the, the business owners who uh, also has um, engineering qualifications showed us his concepts of what he thinks may address the current parking issues in Koran. Like many of our hinterland towns, um, the increased utilisation is leading to some parking woes um, and the his the petitioners hereby have suggested some of the solutions council may consider. I wish to um, table the petition and uh, ask to the CEO, we have our standard wording. We haven't got our standard wording. Okay, anyway, to the CEO and for appropriate response. Thank you, Councillor Stockwell. Second for that. Councillor Wilkie, thank you all in favour. It's unanimous. Thank you, Linda. Yeah. All in favour? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Councillor yeah. Wilkie seconded it. Uh, we have another petition, Councillor Lawrence. Just waiting for the wording. Yeah, it, just the, the wording should have it being referred to the CEO. Um, I have a petition that's signed by 499 people requesting that Council not approve the home based business, small scale meat processing at 82 Patterson Drive. Tibiwa, and I refer um, the petition to the CEO for appropriate response. Thank you. We'll second it. Thank you, Councillor Wilkie. All in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to item number five. There are no notified motions, no presentations. There is item on item seven, one deputation. We have one deputation tonight, and we welcome Kathleen Anshaw and Joanne Wright representing landowners between Warren Street and Marundal Street, Taunton. Uh, would you both like to come up and make your deputation? Uh, understanding orders, you, you probably already know this, but 15 minutes is, is the time limit. Thank you, ladies. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, councillors. Um, we thank you for the opportunity to address council. My name is Joanne Wright, um, and Kathleen and myself will be speaking to you tonight. And we're speaking on behalf of the landowners who reside on Lake Danella from Wareham Street to Marina Street. And this is regarding the proposed Lake Danella foreshore management plan, which we support and which has arisen out of a petition in April for a foreshore walkway around the lake from Wareham Street to Marina Street. We want to raise four important points for council consideration. 
The first one being land ownership and land management. The second one being the impact of any walkway around along the port foreshore in front of lakefront properties in this particular area. The third is the environmental sensitivity of the intertidal zone and indeed the significant environmental importance of the whole lake system. And fourthly, the human aspect and the fracturing of the community created by an unfortunate action that uh, set up some only risky destination. So all of these points lead us to, some, to emphasise particularly the criticality of how this foreshore plan is actually developed and managed, including the importance of establishing strategic reference groups with all of the industry stakeholders. So the first point I'd like to raise is about land ownership. The property owners we represent all have long-standing title deeds issued by the state government, which clearly show there are absolute lakefront properties, lots with ambulatory boundary to the high water mark. Both the council engaged surveyor and the surveyor engaged by us are in full agreement that the largest area fronting the lake, which is actually number one, 51 points around the avenue, is clearly private property to the high water mark, not impacted by any sea. In our view, this means that the foreshore from Wareham Street to Marimba Street cannot be used as a public access within the high water mark. Therefore, if an access along the foreshore within the high water mark is not possible because of this large parcel of unchallengeable land, we wonder if there's any point in proceeding with further investigation of private land types around the rest of the foreshore if this precludes the use of that particular part of the foreshore in total, whether it goes all the way through to the beach or not. Uh, we also ask that given this issue about private ownership, should there be consideration of amending cycling and walkway strategy to remove expectations mm. in the future of a foreshore walkway along the northern section of the lake? Lake Inanna does have a range of extent, a lot of extensive foreshores, including council-owned land, that offer the opportunity of public access and viewpoints without impinging on private property. The second point I want to raise is about the impact of the foreshore walkway. Aside from the whole issue of land tenure is the appropriateness and positioning of the foreshore walkway. We forwarded a picture to the councillors yesterday afternoon. This was taken last Christmas and shows the access to the foreshore is fully underwater. From our consultation with the council to date, it's very clear that a walkway would have to be an elevated structure, which would have to extend out past the high water mark on state government land, um, being within the lake, and would be environmentally problematic and very expensive. It is also clear to us that a splash pathway is totally inappropriate, as witnessed by the walkers and bikers who trampled over mangroves and bird habitats and allowed dogs off the leash. Council's action to temporarily fence off this area was appropriate, if indeed it was agreed by some. Um, thirdly, there's the environmental sensitivity question. Any access that impacts on the intertidal, impacts on the intertidal zone which houses a wide variety of native bird, amphibian and other species, will be in direct contradiction of all of the environmental values that have made Noosa a world-renowned biosphere, and it would be highly detrimental and totally inappropriate. The environmental attributes of the foreshore must be front of mind when access and recreation opportunities are considered. For example, since fishing stopped in the lake, the colony of black swans has grown to 200 plus birds because they feel safe and protected. Significant increase in human access could result in these birds vacating away from together, according to consultations with experienced wildlife experts. I'd now like to thank you for that bit of um, speaking to me. Hand over to my neighbour Kathleen, who will speak on the, uh, the fourth point on the community and human access. Thank, thank you, Jim. Good evening. My name is Kathleen Anshaw. My husband and I are the owners of number one, Rowan Street. I'm also the secretary of the body corporate of the, the Coral Court to Marimba Street, Toronton, where our son Troy has lived for 10 years. These units were built in the 1980s and constructed their lounge rooms on the ground floor and the bedrooms on the upper floor facing the lake. There is no pedestrian access passing these units since they're at the end of a cul-de-sac. Out of the seven units, five are owned by single retirees. We have cared for Troy now for some 50 years. And in these past 10 years, we have worked relentlessly to teach him life skills, to enable him to live independently and to secure his future. 
In mid-August this year, Council made a major error in flashing a track through the intertidal zone of the lake from Shield Street to the Eunice. This was done without environmental investigation, planning, budgeting, or without any discussion to the adjoining landowners. The result was significant environmental damage to native plants, animal habitat, and spillage into the lake from the council machinery. However, cutting the track allowed people to access this area as a walkway. They were very assertive in their calls, frightening and intimidating these vulnerable people in the Eunice. They rode bikes, walked dogs, exited between the two building blocks and up the driveway. They approached owners in their loungers, telling them that they now had access to this as it was a walkway. They even accessed the walkway at 9.25 last Saturday night, using torches. It's extremely disturbing for the residents to think that somebody's walking down the bottom of your property with torches on a Saturday night. I feel that all my work with my son has been totally destroyed, as he's resorted to double locking his doors and closing his curtains through the day in fear. It's very important that council knows this, so that the same mistake of failing to plan is not repeated in the Lake Foreshore study. We totally support the Lake Foreshore study, but it must be one that gives the best outcome to the public while respecting the safety and the security and the privacy of the nearby residential property. There's no, absolutely no point going to the public in a holistic approach until a realistic, sensible guideline is in place to give a framework of what can and cannot be achieved legally, financially, and respect with respect to the stakeholders, <coughs> landholders, council, and state government as well as the sensitive environment area of the lake. We urge you, please, not to repeat the mistakes of the past, but urge you to form a committee of council and of stakeholders in order to set guidelines, which when agreed, will set up a framework to then move forward with a meaningful public discussion and ultimately a workable plan for the lake for short. A committee must include the adjoining landowners. The community has been stressed and divided by the unplanned actions to date. Let's take this opportunity to move forward in a positive way and allow the community to heal. Joanne Montgomery. So in conclusion, um, councillors, we support the proposed recommendation of the full council tonight for the proposed Lake Janela Foreshore Plan to be part of the consideration of the 2023 budget as this enables appropriate funding and further thought to go into the proposal. We also strongly um, recommend to Council the following, that we accept the current land titles to the high water mark and not waste Council resources and funding on more surveying work to support. We continue to ensure that the temporary fences that were erected at either end of the streets in question remain in place to prevent inappropriate access. And we thank you for what you've done so far there. We also recommend that Council form a strategic reference group to set guidelines and parameters before the plan goes out for public consultation so as to avoid misinformation and unnecessary angst from the members of the community. We also ask that the key stakeholders, for example, Council, State Government, Environmental Group, um, local landowners, are part of the reference group. And you can imagine we're certainly going to put up our hands to be part of that group. Um, we, will, well, we hope that this will ensure that information will go out to the public um, at the appropriate time, technically correct, and achieved. We thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you both ladies. That brings us to item eight on page four of the agenda, which is a consideration of the committee reports. Firstly, we have the Planning and Environment Committee recommendations. Items 1, 2, 3 and 4 were referred to the General Committee. Item 5, MCU 21-0164, Development Application for Material Change of Use, Food and Drink Outlet at 652 Hastings Street, Noosa Heads. Item 6 and 7 were referred to General Committee. Item 8, Current Status of Community Conservation Partnership Initiatives. 
Item 9, review of environmental values and water quality objectives for Noosa River Basin. Item 10, planning applications decided by delegated authority, October 2021. Can I have a mover and seconder? Thank you, Councillor Stockwell. Thank you, Councillor Grisovich. All in favour? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Alinda. Next up are the Services and Organisation Committee recommendations. These are on page 9 of the agenda. Item 1, 2021-2022 Community Grants Program, Community Project Grants, Round 2. Item 2, Regional Arts Development Fund, RADIF, Grant Recommendations 21-22. Madam Chair, I have a, I'd like to inform the meeting I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter as one of the proposed grant recipients, Virgo Nash, is the daughter of personal friends, Tanya and Neil Nash. As a result of my conflict of interest, I'll now leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted upon. Thank you, Councillor Wilkie. I'm happy to move the Thank you, Councillor Stockwell, Councillor Grusevich. All in favour? That is unanimous. Yeah, all in favour, unanimous. Thank you, Councillor. You could please. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kat. Item three, 2021-2022 Community <coughs> Program Funding Community Project Grants Round 2, Equipment. Item four, 2021-2022 Community Program Funding Community Project Grants Round 2, Events. Item five, 2021-22, Community Program Funding, Community Project Grants, Round 2, Infrastructure. Item 6, 2021-2022, Community Program Funding, Community Project Grants, Round 2, Programs. Madam Chair, I'd like to inform the meeting I have a prescribed conflict of interest in this matter as I'm the Secretary of the Noosa Gymnastics Club, which is the principal tenant of the Noosa Bicentennial Centre. As a result of my conflict of interest, I'll now leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted upon. Thank you very much, Councillor Wilkie. I'll move the matter. Thank you, Councillor Drisbridge. Second to Councillor Lawrenston. All in favour? Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Cap. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Wilkie. Okay. Item 7 contract number. T000051 Sunshine Beach Skate Park Half Pipe Renewal Tender Award. Item 8 Noosa Library Service Annual Report to 30 June 2021. Item 9 2021 Annual Disaster Management Report. Thank you. So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Switch. Seconded, Councillor Finzel. All in favour? Unanimous. Thank you, Alinda. Now to the General Committee recommendations on page 11 of the agenda. Item 1 was deferred to tonight's meeting and is the subject of a further report that we'll deal with later in the meeting. Item 2, other change for development approval, a material change of use for multiple housing to include short-term accommodation situated at 13 and 15 Park Crescent, Sunshine Beach. Councillor Lawrenston. Um, hi, Councillor Lawrence, and inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter due to my personal relationship with the applicant, Mark Bang, and the Bang family, who are family friends. We have attended social events together, and our children have attended school together. As a result of my conflict of interest, I will leave the meeting room while the matter is considered in the other time. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. We have a recommendation before us. I'll move to refuse it. Uh, Councillor Wilkie, seconded. Councillor Drusevich, uh, all in favour? So it's Councillor Stockwell, Drusevich. This is for the short term building to approve or refuse the one in Sun Sunshine Beach. So this is for this is to reject it. This is this is to follow the staff recommendation, which is is calling for refusal. Yeah. So offer um, Councillor Stockwell, Councillor Drusevich, Councillor Wagner, Councillor Wilkie against. Council Finzel, Council Stewart. Thank you, Belinda. Can we leave him? Thank you. Thanks, Karen. We are on item three, page fourteen of our agendas. MCU sixteen slash zero one three eight. 
0.03 and OPW 16-0257.03 other change for development approval for material change of use for two times multiple dwelling houses, two duplexes and operational works, engineering works and landscaping to include short-term accommodation at 1 slash 113 Gympie Terrace, Nusaville, Council of Stockwell. Uh, yes, I wish to declare a declarable conflict of interest on the same basis I did on Monday. It's a long declaration, so I won't read it out again. Thank you. And I do wish at the bottom there to, I choose to remain in the meeting room. However, we'll respect the decision of the meeting on whether I can remain and participate in the decision. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Rusevich. Chair, I'll move the Council note the declarable conflict of interest by Council of Stockholm, which is in the public interest that Council of Stockholm participates in votes in this matter, because Council believes the Council of Stockholm does not stand to receive a personal benefit or loss in relation to the matter, and therefore a reasonable person would trust that, a, that the final decision is made in the public interest, as we have done previously. Thank you, Councillor Drusevich. I'll second, I'll, I'll second that. Councillor Drusevich, would you like to speak to that? No. Okay, all in favour? That is unanimous, noting that Councillor Stockwell did not vote. Thank you, Alinda. I'll move the refusal. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Wilkie. Seconded? Councillor Wigner. <laughs> <laughs> Finally got their time. <laughs> uh, all in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you, Alinda. Item four. RAL 21 slash 007 development application for reconfiguring a lot, one lot into 12 lots assessed under the superseded planning scheme at 111 Lake Wyber Drive, Nooseville. I, Councillor Stewart, inform the meeting that I have prescribed conflict of interest in relation to this matter as Kirsty Miller, the ex wife of Mr. Bob Link, Director of Link and Link Surveys, PTY LTD, the applicant, donated $5,000 on the 12th, the 22nd, 20. $5,000 on the 6th of the 3rd, 2020, $1,900 on the 27th of the 2nd, 2020, and $1,900 on the 27th of the 2nd, 2020, to my 2020 election campaign. As a result of my conflict of interest, I will now leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted on. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Mayor Stewart. Now, protocol requires that the Deputy Mayor takes the chair while the Mayor is absent. We have councillors, we have a, a motion before us. I'm happy to uh, refuse on the grounds outlined in the motion. Mm -hmm. Councillor Stockwell, we have a seconder, please. Second. Seconded Councillor Lawrenson. Councillor Stockwell, you wish to speak to the motion? I do not. Any other councillors wish to speak to the motion? No. We'll put the motion. All in favour? That's carried. No, we have the Mayor back, please. We are now up to item five on the general committee recommendations on page 16 of the agenda. Item five, 2021-2022 Environmental Grants Program Round Two. Councillor Wagner. I, Councillor Wagner, inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter as I am the president of Permaculture Mesa, <coughs> which has applied for funding under the Climate Change Response Grant category of the 21-22 Environmental Grants Program, round two. As a result of my conflict, I will leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted on. Thank you, Councillor Wigner. Uh, I too wish to declare a declarable conflict of interest in regard to the climate response grant application submitted by Zero Emissions Nursery Group. Once again, it's quite a long declaration, but it is exactly the same as on Monday, and uh, I uh, put up there as read. Uh, similarly, I declare a, a declarable conflict of interest in relation to the application by Nusa District Land Care, uh, once again, by the same reasons that I've declared several times before and as on the board. In both instances, I, I, I will choose to remain in the meeting room. However, I will respect the decision of the meeting on whether I can remain and participate in the decision. Councillor Rusevich. Madam Chair, I will move that Council note the declarable conflict of interest by Council Stockwell and determine it's in the public interest that Council Stockwell participates in votes on the matter because Council believes that he does not stand to receive personal benefit or loss in relation to the matter and does not have a close personal relationship with Mr. Wright for land care and therefore a reasonable person would trust that the final decision is made in the public interest. Oh, I'll second that. I do so on the grounds that we've already discussed uh, the matter before uh, in, in previous meetings and Council uh, Council Stockwell's association with those entities and have come up with uh, uh, no, no, uh, no uh, concerns with him being uh, uh, part of the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Vistich. I'll put the matter for vote. All in favour? That is unanimous, noting that Councillor Stockwell did not vote. Thank you, Alinda. 
Uh, can we have a okay. mover for the recommendation, please? I'll Councillor move. Wilkie, okay. second of Councillor Finzel. Thank you. All in favour? That is unanimous. Thanks, Kath. Just a point of order. Um, as the, the recommendation coming from General Committee has no res reference to the eastern beaches, I don't think there is any need to declare. To, 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 to uh, further on, the, the only reason that uh, the two councils declared originally was a staff recommendation. That staff recommendation is no longer part of this item. Um, so that the item is about deferring the matter. No, I, I just if I put a counter view if I, I may. Yeah. The fact that it's before us means it's still debatable. Yeah. Uh, it could be debated in this forum, so it's appropriate that the topic is declared in my opinion. Okay. Yeah. I think to be I think to be safe and to be overly cautious, we should de declare. Thank you, Councillor Thank Fenzel. you. Thank you for noting. I, Councillor Fenzel, inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter, as on 5th of March 2020, Mr. Peter Butt who is an executive member of the Eastern Beaches Protection Association, donated $1,666.66 to my 2020 election campaign, where I was one of three candidates that ran as a group known as Future Noosa, which is no longer an entity. Although I have a declarable conflict of interest, I do believe a reasonable person could have a perception of bias because I believe that I do not have a close personal relationship with Mr Butt, and I believe I can consider this matter impartially and in the public interest. Therefore, I will choose to remain in the meeting room. However, I will respect the decision of the meeting on whether I can remain and participate in the decision. Thank you. Um, I, Councillor Lawrenson, inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter as my brother Gabriel Cherisani owns a property at Beaches Estate Sunrise and is also a member of the Executive Committee of the Eastern Beaches Protection Association. During my election campaign, my brother helped me with my campaign, hand, handed out voting cards until my election signs were outside his property on David Lowe Way. Although I have a declarable conflict of interest and I believe I could consider the matter impartially and in the public interest, um, I will choose to remain in the meeting room. However, I will respect the decision of the meeting on whether I can remain and participate in the decision. Thank you, Councillor Lawrence. Councillor Driscoll. Oh. Move that council note the declarable conflict of interest by Councillor Finzel and determine it's in the public interest that Councillor Finzel remain in the meeting room for this item on the condition she does not participate in the debate nor vote on issues regarding the private estate along the eastern beaches because Council believes that Councillor Finzel could provide valuable input into the discussion and therefore a reasonable person would trust that the final decision is made in the public interest. I Councillor second that. Wilkie, thank you. Just, just may explain for those that uh, are in the gallery and may be watching the reason that uh, uh, a declaration about and Eastern Beaches uh, uh, plan and uh, comes up during the Lake Donella foreshore management plans because the original uh, recommendation by staff referred to that plan as part of its recommendation and conflict of trying to achieve two foreshore management plans within the one financial year. Thank you, Councillor Bruce, which we'll, we'll put the uh, matter to a vote. All in favour? That is unanimous, noting that Councillor uh, Finzel and Councillor Lawrenston did not vote. Thank you, Alinda. Thank well, you. Once Councilor again, Bruce. I will move the Council note to declare a conflict of interest by Councillor Lawrenston and determine it's in public interest that Councillor Lawrenston remain in the meeting room for this item on the condition that she does not participate in the debate nor vote on issues regarding the part private estate along the eastern beaches because Council believes that Councillor Lawrenston can provide valuable input into the decision. And therefore, a reasonable person would trust that the final decision is made in the public interest. Thank you. Council. I'll second it. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Wilkie. Councillor. All right. All in favour? That is unanimous. Oh. Uh, Councillors, you can vote. No. No. no, 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 no. All in favour is no. noting that Councillor Finzel and Councillor Lawrenson did not vote. Uh, can I have a move for the recommendation? I will move the council's <coughs> resolution. The council note the report by the Environment Services Manager acting to the Planning and Environment Committee dated meeting dated 7th of December 2021 and that the potential new initiative to produce a foreshore management plan for Lake Donella be referred to the 2022-23 budget process so that it can be assessed against other priorities set down in relevant strategies and plans. Thank you, Councillor. I'll Councilor. second that. Thank you, Councillor Joe. Uh, look, I'd just like to thank uh, the um, uh, the deputation that was uh, presented to us tonight, uh, uh, and taking the time to uh, address council on the on the matter. The Lake Donella foreshore management plan is one that uh, I presented 
as a as a ways and means of uh, resolving it, a number of the conflicts that have arisen in the last 12 months around uh, areas in Lake uh, Denlara as outlined by the deputation. And I welcome the opportunity for this uh, foreshore management plan to be presented as a budget uh, item for next year's budget consideration. Thank you, Councillor Driscoll. Do anyone else like to speak to this? Would you like to, would, would you like to close, John? Okay, we'll put the uh, recommendation to a vote. All in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Item 7, MCU 21 slash 0104, application for material change of use, motorcycle, scooter sales and repair and caretakers accommodation situated at 16 Rennie Street, New Seville. We have received advice from staff that the applicant for this item has stopped the decision period for 40 business days to support the provision of additional information to council for assessment. This means council cannot decide the application while the decision period remains stopped. Therefore, I move that council note the report of the development planner to the general committee meeting dated 13th of December 2021 regarding application number MCU 21 slash 0104 from material change of use, motorcycle, scooter sales and repair and caretakers accommodation situated at 16 Rennie Street, Nooseville, and note that the applicant has stopped decision period pursuant to the Planning Act 2016 in order to provide additional information to council for assessment. Can I have a second? Thank you, Councillor Finzel. Um, I won't speak to the motion. Um, all in favour? Or anyone else have to speak to it? Oh. No. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Thank you. Item 8. Housing needs assessment. Um, I would like to move the recommendation with the addition of an item G as shown on the screen. That the housing needs assessment and housing strategy further consider the specific housing needs for key workers and explore all opportunities for appropriately located accommodation types, including analysis of whether the industrial zone should provide for key worker accommodation. Chair, I'll second that. Thank you, Councillor. Look, I do so because this, this matter arose uh, on Monday and we talked about it and we talked about support for it but we were all united in the fact that we needed to go through proper process we needed to undertake further study we have a housing report before us dealing with the whole manner of opportunities ideas and strategies the addition of this one makes sense <coughs> we went round and round with this on Monday and as I said we all agreed that we should not in the case before us make policy on the run that is ensuring that we take the necessary and relevant steps the proper and due process is given to the idea, the opportunities, the benefits and the costs are weighed up in detail. This kind of accommodation is, in my opinion, worker accommodation in the best sense and it needs further investigation and its merits need to be debated and discussed by our strategic planners, our economic development team, our DA team and a whole host of others, including ourselves. We know we are in a crisis. We know it's not business as usual. We know workers are finding it almost impossible to find a place to live. We acknowledge all that. Now let's put our money where our mouth is and act on it, or at least agree to explore the opportunities for industrial zones to provide key worker accommodation. Um, I'd just like to quickly note, um, I've been following um, my local GP, a very well-paid Person, a person who is very overqualified to be a GP in, in Koroi. He's been an youth assistant, worked throughout the world. And um, he just loves, loves Nusa, wants to live here. And uh, he sold his house before COVID. Now he decided to be a renter. Uh, last Monday, he went through the entire range of, to try to find a rental accommodation. He could, he could happily pay $1,200 a week. He could find none in Nusa. So the, 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 thought that I, that I would like to present to um, planning is that a key um, worker includes doctors, includes very, very well-paid people. It's across the board. It's not, even, it's not only our, our hospitality and so forth. This includes our most well-paid people. They can't find places to live in Nusa either. So I just wanted to make, make that note that it's, it's, it's much broader than we may think. Thank you, Tom. Um, we, I should have also noted, we have Kerry here, if anyone has any questions um, in regard to um, num letter G. <coughs> Kerry, there's no questions. Is there any questions? No, I'm, I'm happy to support that additional uh, the additional clause. I think uh, the debate and the discussion around uh, this led to uh, 
uh, item F being added on uh, on Monday to advocate the state government uh, for their role in dealing with the elements of uh, the housing outcomes across housing, social housing, affordable housing, and, uh, and the challenges that uh, that are presented as a result of, uh, of of the current policies regarding uh, uh, this and long term lack of uh, support for these type of uh, elements in the uh, in the state housing that is causing us to look at areas like G and seeing whether there are. Uh, uh, other areas where and other opportunities within our uh, our planning scheme and our planning zones to see where we can accommodate cheap workers because it is a challenge for uh, for our community going forward. Like uh, Councillor uh, uh, Wegner, this week I have had someone that is closely known to me and uh, via social media has declared that they have been made out, uh, homeless by one coming to the end of their tenancy agreement and the owner no longer want, wishing to continue that tenancy agreement and struggling to find a locality uh, to, uh, in which to live within uh, within our shire. Following mm -hmm. on from that, several other people on the same post have said the same thing. Coming to the end of the finance, coming to the end of the uh, the uh, the calendar year that, uh, at Christmas time, that presents uh, uh, another element of uh, a struggle and uh, and challenge for all families uh, within the shire that uh, find themselves in that situation. So I'm more than supportive of the mayor's. Uh, Process here in getting the housing needs assessment undertaken in June. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Good. I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank the mayor for bringing this forward um, and for the councillors for raising this debate when we had the opportunity the other day. I think, given what we've heard around the table and across the past year around the housing crisis, it is appropriate that we do leave no stone unturned and that we look at every opportunity to house our um, residents in the Shire, especially our key workers, our essential workers who are the most casualised and often but not always one of the lowest paid in our community. So thank you. Yes, look I'll be supporting the Mayor's um, motion with the with the change because it's very carefully worded because it, it includes um, uh, the question of the analysis will include whether the industrial zone should provide for key worker accommodation. This doesn't mean it's a fait accompli that will happen because a careful analysis will also present councillors with information about competing interests and how important the industrial estates are for the diversification of our economy. So the question of competing needs, whether we need the industrial estates to help diversify and enrich our economy away from the traditional mainstays of construction and tourism, or whether they become de facto housing estates. It would be a very important debate, but the, mayor, the mayor's um, uh, and then the uh, motion is an excellent one, very well worded, and I fully support it. Thank you, Councillor Wilkie. Councillor Bronson? Councillor Stockler? Uh, I'll, I'll uh, waive my right to reply, uh, put the motion to a vote. All in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Alinda. That brings us to ordinary meeting reports. I oh, beg your pardon, no, sorry, I beg your pardon. Item I beg your pardon, item nine, I beg your pardon. Draft Economic Development Strategy 2021 to 30. Item 10, Fraud and Corruption Policy. Item 11, Financial Performance Report, November 21. Item 12, Confidential, not public release, appointment of specialised supplier for economic development event in 2022. And I'll move the recommendation of the Thank you, Councillor Wilkie. Okay, okay Councillor Finzel. Second, Alinda. All in favour? Unanimous. Thank you, Alinda. We are now up to item nine. Report directly to the ordinary meeting. Your declarations first. We have two reports directly to the ordinary meeting, starting on page 22 of the agenda. But number one. Further report MCU 21 slash 0154 development application for a material change of use home based business small scale meat processing at 82 Patterson Drive, Tim Beerwan. My Council Stewart informed the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter as I was approached by the applicant's adjoining neighbour, Kirsty Pocock, who advised me that our sons play football together. Although I have a declarable conflict of interest, I do not believe a reasonable person could have a perception of bias as I believe that I do not have a close personal relationship with Ms. Pocock. I also declare that I similarly received a submission from Laura Prater who also lives in the area. I have met Ms. Prater on a number of occasions and our children go to daycare together. 
Although I have a declarable conflict of interest, I do not believe a reasonable person can have a perception of bias as I believe that I do not have a close personal relationship with Ms Prater. I further inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter as when I attended an on-site meeting with the applicant Adam Nielsen on 15th of December 2021, he advised me that he coached my son in cricket last year. I had no recollection of this as I did not attend any cricket practices. When I asked him if, he had, if we had met previously, Mr Nielsen advised that he waved and introduced himself to me once at a night cricket match when I was working in the canteen at the match. Although I have a declarable conflict of interest, I do not believe a reasonable person could have a perception of bias as I do not believe I have a close personal relationship with Mr Nielsen. In regard to these three declar declarations, I believe I can consider this matter impartially and in the public interest and therefore I choose to remain in the meeting room. However, I respect the decision of the meeting on whether I can remain and participate in the decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Councillor. Um, we have a um, motion before us. Someone care to move on? Yeah. I'll move Councilor the Stockwell. standard motion in relation to all three that uh, the Councillor Stewart be allowed to stay in the meeting. Can I have a second of that, please? Second. second of Councillor Finnegan. I do so. As, as noted on Monday, uh, uh, the first two were declared. Uh, the third one came up as a result of an exchange since. Um, none of them meet the statutory benchmark for a declarable conflict of interest, so it's actually a, uh, a, a, a an excessively cautious approach of just I'm putting everything on the table so the public knows, which is something we always encourage. And so it's, it's uh, something that is on now on the record but would not prevent uh, Councillor Stewart from participating in a unbiased fashion. Thank you, Councillor Stockwell. Any other councillors wish to speak to the motion? Put the motion. Those in favour? That's carried. Uh, that's um, that's uh, all councillors except for Councillor Stewart in favour of that motion. Unanimous. And Councillor Stewart did not vote on the motion. Thank you. Mayor Thank Stewart, you. welcome back. Thank you, Councillor Wilkie. <laughs> we have Kerry Coyle, our Development Assessment Manager, and Leo Jensen, our Acting Director of Environment and Sustainable Development, here for this report. Kerry, could you please give a summary of this report? Sure. Um, so this is an application for a home-based business. Thank you. This is an application for a home-based business for a meat processing facility uh, to operate on a rural residential property in Tinsiwa. Um, the application is to be operated solely by the resident of the property, uh, with no employees on site. Um, once a week, the resident will harvest deer, um, and the deer will be eviscerated and blooded out in the field. They'll then be wrapped and returned by a vehicle to the property, um, where they'll be um, uh, processed in the, in the shed. Um, the shed is approximately 51 square metres, it's a small shed on site. It has already been fitted out for this purpose, and it's a fully insured shed. So 98% of the adult electricity used um, in the meat processing facility, or use for product, uh, for future sale at the market. So um, the, the operator will transport the, um, the product to the market both on a Saturday and a Sunday. Um, so the, there's some further material in the report to council at the ordinary meeting um, that talks about that the meat processing will only occur two days a week uh, between 8 and 5 p.m. So we have received a number of submissions to this application, uh, 16 properly made submissions and 8 not properly made. To be fair to say, residents are very concerned about this proposal. Um, they feel that the nature of the business is not appropriate for the site and that it will adversely impact on their amenities that they currently enjoy from the property. Um, they're all concerned, also concerned that the scale of the business will grow, even though the applicant has presented with quite small scale, they're concerned that it will grow in time. Um, so the application is recommended for approval by officers. Officers have found that the proposal is compliant with the planning scheme, that the proposal is small scale in nature, um, will be fully contained within the shed, and for that reason, it will not adversely impact on residential amenities, despite residents' concerns. So it is recommended for approval. Um, there's a number of conditions uh, that are uh, recommended to control the scale in the future and ensure the business will not impact on residential amenities. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question for staff. You uh, stated there, and it's something I've heard from uh, a number of the uh, um, those concerned about this. 
the scale of the operation if the scale continues to grow. The element of, uh, of conditions on a planning approval, what is the power of those conditions and what uh, if uh, the applicant breaches those conditions, what are the, uh, what are the uh, relevant uh, actions that uh, are undertaken or may be undertaken? Um, uh, so development approvals are enforceable under the Planning Act regulations and there are templates for enforcement uh, through the show cause enforcement notice or council is also able to issue infringement notices, fines, for non compliance with development approvals. Ultimately, if there's, if there's further issues and the applicant continues, council is able to take action through the planning environment. So, could that result in the, uh, the uh, approval being withdrawn by the court? Not withdrawn, but the court can give orders for compliance with the approval. And it's a very serious offence to um, breach a court order, including jail time. Madam Chair, I'd like to move the staff recommendation with some additional conditions. And those conditions are Condition 17 that the harvesting vehicle is required to be enclosed or fully covered such that carcasses are not visible during transportation. 18, to minimise the potential impacts of the operator's vehicle and refrigerator trailer returning to and departing from the site, the operator must dim vehicle lights at night time when departing and returning to the site, if safe and practical to do so. And B, keep mechanical equipment associated with refrigeration and cooling of the trailer turned off until the vehicle has left the subject site. Under landscaping works, we'll add condition 19, the access handle must be densely must be densely landscaped with native vegetation plants and shrubs to provide a dense screen of vegetation between the driveway and neighbouring residents. And 20, all landscape works must be established and maintained in accordance with the approved design for the life of the development and in a manner that ensures healthy, sustained and vigorous plant growth. All plant material must be allowed to grow into full form and be refurbished when its life expectancy is reached. Thank you, Councillor Spitz. I'm happy to second that. Thank you, Councillor Finzel. Councillor Jones. Just a, uh, a sorry, it's, been, it's, a, it's a point of, point of uh, order. This is marked as an amendment. This is actually an original it's, it's, motion. It's, it's, yes. yes, it's not an amendment. It's, it is a continuation of the original the original motion. It's, 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 yeah. oh, Additional it's, conditions it's to, the original, to the original motion. No, just take out the heading. Yeah. 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 Amendment. Thank you, Councillor. Thank, yeah. you, thank, thank you. you for raising that point of order. And, and that was seconded by Councillor Finzel too. And you'll need to the, wording. the wording will be um, that the development be approved uh, subject to conditions recommended by staff with the addition yeah. of with the conditions recommended by staff And the addition of conditions yeah. Yeah. and take out seventeen and twenty and take out and be added. If you delete the word two words be added, it'll make sense. Yep. Yeah. Okay, happy with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that was the intent of what was moved. There's something in the sentence around the landscaping though. Yeah, that's quite reasonable. Yeah, the access hand. The access hand. So to clarify, and I'll use my uh, uh, planning uh, assessment uh, officer here, the access handle was wording that was uh, provided by uh, planning staff. Uh, if you'd like to clarify that the, the definition of access handle, so to be clearly understood by both the applicant and uh, and anybody that uh, wishes to question. Um, the lot is a um, term is a barrel shaped lot, so it's access via an access handle or a driveway. <coughs> um, so it's just a reference to the shape of the lot where the driveway is. So the, the condition requires landscaping along the driveway. Thank you, Thank you Kerry. Councillor Jones. Thank you. If I may talk to um, Yes, so I, I do move the staff recommendation. Uh, staff, in their professional uh, opinion, have uh, assessed the application before us and it's deemed that it meets the planning scheme and meets the uh, the left hand column of the uh, of the planning scheme which is the sorry the play, I've just forgotten the term here. Performance. performance outcomes thank you the performance outcomes of the planning scheme. 
the, uh, the reason for adding these four additional uh, uh, clauses are to meet the concerns that I heard from residents when we were uh, attending the site with regard to one, carcasses being only covered in a muslin cloth and that people could see visible, visibly see carcasses being transported to and from the site. And I don't think that, uh, that that's necessarily something that, <coughs> that everybody would like to see. Uh, to minimise the impact on the on the uh, the uh, vehicles returning at night, particularly at two o'clock in the morning, to, to dim the lights, I don't think is an, a, an unacceptable uh, uh, request of the uh, of the uh, the applicant when he's driving into the site. That he keeps his mechanical equipment uh, turned off until he has left the subject site, so that uh, as not to disturb uh, any neighbours if the generator is operating on that. And the additional landscape works are something I heard from the directly from the neighbour adjoining the property of that, uh, that driveway, that they can see the vehicle going up and down the driveway, that the lights could disturb them, that the sight of the animals and the knowledge that the animals are being transported to and from. So the additional screening was to address the concerns that I heard from both neighbours and other residents with regard to those elements of impact that they felt they could not, uh, could not admit. Thank you, Councillor Joe. Uh, I'll, I'll continue on after that. Um, yeah, I do, and I, I do, I do support this for uh, for several reasons. Um, I have, uh, and I understand the action, the, the actions, and the operation of of a business like this. I had a butcher, uh, an uncle that was a butcher growing up, and we conducted this sort of activity on uh, at home on a regular basis. Uh, we would go out to a farm, we would acquire an animal, we would viscerate the animal, we would bring it home. And my uncle would uh, would attend to that as part of our cultural growing up, uh, with a European background, not on a, a rural uh, acreage of life, but in a domestic shed on a domestic property. Uh, so I've I've seen and understand the impacts and uh, and the concerns of residents with regard to how <laughs> this process is undertaken, and I believe that those uh, those elements of that can be managed. I also I've also. Uh, Heard the concerns about the refrigerated vehicle uh, and the refrigerated trailer. I used to operate a refrigerated uh, vehicle and had it parked on a domestic property here in the in the trial. So I understand the potential impacts of of the refrigerated vehicle, having had one myself and operated it. So I have heard and heard the uh, concerns, and I, but I believe, like staff do, that the uh, the um, the impacts of this uh, development application can be managed yeah. and can be managed with impact, uh, with, uh, with uh, various conditions and those additional conditions I think uh, add to the concerns of the neighbours. Um, I'd, like to ask, I'd like to ask a question. Um, the Home Raised Business Code and the NISA plan stipulates um, A09.2 that on properties less than four hectares in area the home-based business does not include an operation that would otherwise be, de be defined as a low-impact industry. My question is, um, why is why is that um, condition um, included? Um, sorry, Councillor, when you say why is that condition included? What, yes. What meant that? Um, why does the Home Based Business Code include that condition that low impact industries should not be located in properties less than four hectares? Uh, sure. So, the NISA plan is a performance based planning scheme, um, which is required for all planning schemes of Queensland. That's how the planning legislation works in Queensland. So, the planning scheme is set up in terms of the Home Based Business Code, you have performance outcomes and you have acceptable measures. So the applicant has the choice to meet either the performance outcome or the acceptable measures. Um, the acceptable measures are usually spelled out quite specifically and about trying to minimise and um, manage the potential impact of home-based businesses on, on residents. Um, so there is an inference in, the, in by the accepted measures that these types of industries <coughs> Um, would not be appropriate on the smaller rural residential block. That's what the Accessible Development parameters say. Um, however, we must also look at the performance outcome. And that comes down to can this business operate on the site without adversely impacting nearby residents' amenities with crisis size? Um, would you consider <laughs> that the properties located along Patterson Drive as relatively small rural blocks and if so, was this taken into account as part of the assessment? Uh, 
So the properties are under the planning scheme in the rural residential zone. Um, they are all uh, similar in size along there. They're, they're generally consistent with what you would find in a rural residential area. So they're, sort of, they're home, um, you know, lifestyle <coughs> properties. Um, on a rural residential property, you would expect some rural activities to occur because the main choose if their property is large enough to have some um, animals on the site or to carry out uh, some small scale rural activities. Um, so uh, the business, the, the home based business, is a consistent use in that zone. Um, it is expected that home based businesses would operate in the area. And again, it's about whether the, the business <coughs> can successfully operate there without adversely impacting the business. Um, in the report, there's a statement that the proposed use maintains a domestic scale and operates in a manner that is subordinate to the res residential use on the premises. Um, can you explain how a medium impact industry is domestic or small in nature um, and how a meat processing <coughs> industry is subordinate to the residential, residential, residential use of the property? Um. So the proposed business is to operate sort of, uh, in a shed that is 51 square meters. So that shed is much smaller in scale than the house on the site. Um, it's supposed to be operated by the resident. There are no employees um, proposed uh, on, uh, as part of the proposal. Um, so uh, the business is fully contained. So any potential noise impacts are managed by the fact that it's within an enclosed building. Um, so that is why officers have considered that it is of an appropriate scale. Um, so just, just, um. Um, and in terms of the retrospective um, approval, um, this is for possibly the benefit of people watching tonight and also people in the audience. Um, the applicant has said, and he generally did not he believed that he generally did not need to apply for a development application for his business um, and that he contacted council planning and building offices prior to retrofitting his sheet for advice. Can you talk me through this, please? Yeah. Um, I understand that he did contact council um, prior to doing any fit out of his shed on site. Um, so he contacted a planning officer in, in my team. Uh, that panel is no longer with us, so I don't know the extent of the conversation. Um, but I do understand that he took from that conversation that he did not require a planning approval to operate the home based business. Um, and so he proceeded to buy the equipment necessary to fit out his shed for this business. So, rhetoric question, but in his opinion, he genuinely believed that he was following due process. Yes, I, I understand that. That's my understanding that he thought he was following due process. Thank you. So just to follow on from that question, um, if this wasn't a business operation, does the owner have the right to hunt an animal, bring it home viscerated, and um, clean the animal up and prepare the animal for home use uh, out if it was not a business activity? Uh, yes, that's correct. If he was to do it for his own purposes and um, not to look to uh, on sell any of the product and just for his own personal use, um, he would not require any sort of from council. Councillor Wilkie. Yes, um, <laughs> if the, the applicant had approached council staff for a pre lodgement meeting and hadn't built the, the facility and said, This is what I'm intending to do. Would the staff have, have been uh, encouraging him in that regard, or advising that it's an appropriate land use on that lot? Yeah, uh, if, if he had had a, a pre lodgement with staff, um, we would have taken him through the planning scheme requirements for a home based business, and he meets a lot of those requirements because the home based businesses, our scheme does envisage a shed of this size being used as a home based business. Um, it actually permits him to have employees under our planning scheme if he wished to, but he has not applied for that in this instance. We would have talked to him about the potential impacts to neighbours, but we would have talked to him about the mechanical equipment that he was using, and that would have been our primary focus uh, in such a meeting to ensure that it was fully contained and would not impact on residents and relatives, which he knows. Uh, we would have also talked him through um, waste and how he was going to deal with that, 
and obviously he can't work the week and arrive home at 2 a.m. in the morning. So that's something we really want to do. So, but yes, in a, in a pre lodgement meeting, um, we would not have discouraged him to lodge the application. In fact, we would have indicated like we put forth his lodging application, subject to, to considering any submissions received from residents and what the submission included. <laughs> and in conjunction with the building application, are you aware of the applicant has the uh, necessary approvals, plumbing approvals, and placed uh, uh, trap uh, remo uh, process approvals uh, on the property? Uh, yes, he does. He has obtained the appropriate plumbing approval, and that's gone through the inspection by our plumbing department on site. Um, the works that he has done to the building in the fit out, um, whilst I'm not a, um, a building certifier, uh, in my opinion, they require a building approval, um, and he has not obtained that. Um, and so, if council were to approve that this application, that will be a requirement for him to obtain a building approval. Um, I'd like to move an amendment. Uh, that this permit lapses on 17th December 2022 unless written consent is provided by council to extend the approval. In ass assessing an extension, council will have regard to any complaints received from nearby residents concerning breaches of the development approvals and any other relevant matters. Second. Thank you, Councillor Wilkie. Amelia? Um, I'm going to be upfront. I, I'm not supporting this application to approve the application, but I've included this amendment um, because the interests of the community and their welfare matters to me. And in case this motion is successful, um, I think it's just prudent to add a clause like this. I think it's fair to say that um, the feelings and opinions of our community matter to everyone around this table. And um, it's clear from the conditions uh, and the impacts, the way the impacts have been managed, um, that this very highly likely this this um, application will be approved tonight. But this is a very good way of ensuring that the community will have ongoing input through proper process if any of these extensive conditions are breached. Um, impacts that the community have raised regarding noise from machinery, uh, whether when it's, especially when it's operating, smells, traffic are very real and they have very real fear of this and about these impacts being uh, severe. And there's the sort of impacts that anyone in any community with uh, this sort of application next door could rightly feel. So, this is a good way of ensuring that the applicant stays within the confines of the conditions and operates his um, business lawfully and it does give council the, op the opportunity to consider carefully how these conditions have been abided by with strong regard to the resident views in the meantime. Thank you, Councillor Wilkie. Would anyone else like to speak to this amendment by Councillor Einstein? Mm. Can I just make a quick yes, question sure. to the staff? Um, are you able to explain how this process would work? And is it, how would that work? Um, so it is it's a condition that uh, staff have drafted for Councillor Romero. Um, and it is one that we have used on um, other approvals in the Shire where we had some doubt about the proposal's operation and whether it would be successful in meeting these conditions. Um, um, so it is consistent with other approvals we've given, but it's intended that uh, before the 17th of December 2022, the applicant would write to council and they would request an extension to this time frame in order for this development approval to continue. At that time, officers would prepare a report to council and we would include any issues raised throughout the next 12 months by residents um, and we would make a recommendation to council as to whether it should be extended or not. If the applicant was not to make that request before the 17th of December 2022, uh, the approval would lapse 
the Somalian Council did not agree to extend the approval because it would be finished in the Thank you, Sarah. Councillor Wagner. Um, when it comes to that, I know that the, um, the No Worries Caravan Park had a similar uh, uh, clause, and they didn't. They weren't notified, and the, and the council and the the extension lapsed because it was just just a goof up. Um, what sort of notice do you, do you give them? Notice to say, hey, to, to, to remind them that this is coming up. Uh, Officer talked about the No Worries Caravan Caravan Park in Croy yes. on Holt Road. Um, the applicant was actually advised of that. Um, so there was discussion um, before the day it lapsed, or you know, a few days before it lapsed, and the applicant didn't make that application. And no, we do not have a practice of informing applicants around this time that their responsibility to track their dogs is one of their conditions, and they would need to meet that. So, so in that regard, how would any complaints received be dealt with, and uh, what would can be considered a breach of the development approval conditions? Um, there's conditions uh, um, recommended to council around noise. There's, conditions, there's, a, there's a number of conditions recommended about not having harvesting more than five deer. We've re uh, received correspondence from the applicant raising concerns that they're breaching those. There will be an investigation by officers um, to determine whether there was a real breach, and that would form part of the report to council. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else like to speak to this amendment? Just one question. Um, you made the statement that we've used this in the past where we had some doubt about the conditions. From your report, there didn't seem to be much doubt, and from our, our further analysis in terms of sound and the, the description of the process around noise and, and lights, to me, it doesn't appear that there would be much doubt that this is a operation that could be uh, affected within the planning scheme. Is that correct? Um, that's correct. Officers are not recommending this condition. Um, officers have had draft it for the council. Um, so we are satisfied that this approval can operate and we meet those conditions of approval and operate in a manner that will not have this impact on the group community. I'm going to ask that to speak to this amendment. Uh, Councillor Einstein, would you like to close? Mm. We'll put it to a vote. All in favour? That is Councillor Griswich, Councillor Finzel, Councillor Lawrenston, Councillor Walkey, Councillor Stewart against, Councillor Stockwell, Councillor Wegner. That is included now in the original motion passed. <coughs> we go back to the original motion and the only person who has spoken to that is Councillor Jurisovich. Look, I'll speak. Um, look, um, before Councillor Jurisovich closes, I, I need to say a few things. Um, the most critical aspect of a planning scheme protections for neighbours in situations like this is the performance outcome. It requires that a home based business does not result in noise, vibration, odour, and other neg negative impacts for neighbours. These are exactly the concerns that neighbours. Patterson Drive had expressed in writing and in person about this operation. Perhaps the most worrying and impactful is the noise and potential disturbance coming from machinery and the sound of machinery in operation. These are very real and entirely understandable fears. Neighbours anywhere could rightly have in this situation, as I said before. At Monday's meeting and in the report it was stated noise coming from the compressors saw immense of were virtually inaudible the sound of a pool pump. And I had no way of knowing the veracity of that at that stage because it was when the machinery is in operation that the neighbours expressed to me that they had the most concern. They feared that there'd be the sound, a high pitched sound of the, the saw going through bone and when the mincer is in operation. So we have to see for ourselves and hear for ourselves what that was like. I was not prepared to accept the conditions as read until I'd seen for myself. We had a site visit there yesterday and I was standing next to the shed and when the machinery was in operation, it was a hum and it was very difficult to distinguish when the saw was operating through bones. I had to, 
I was surprised to hear that it had actually occurred on several occasions. So I had convinced myself that the impact in terms of the operation of that, that machinery on neighbours was not as, as loud as feared. But me saying that there's no consolation for the people who've got to live there. They are still very distressed that this is going ahead. And that's why I'm pleased that is not the right word. I am supporting the changes to the approval made by Councillor Jurisovic and Councillor Lawrenson that will further mitigate the impacts of this home-based business on neighbours and the residential amenity of the neighbourhood and also put in place a process whereby there's greater incentive for those conditions to be met, if there's any doubt about them being met, and a process for neighbours to have input into the council on an ongoing basis that will feed into the uh, issuing of that approval after one year. It's one of the hardest thing, things to have to do as a council. We all want to serve and assist our community the best we can and delivering a difficult, difficult news like this is very it's hard, but not as hard for the people who are impacted by our decisions. I just like to say that. That's why I'm supporting this motion. And I have a question in regards to the sound monitoring unit that was used yesterday. Um, did we go back and conduct a test at night? There was ambient noise um, yesterday during the day and my understanding that when you test um, noise at night it's fractional um, in comparison to daytime noise so will, will that happen um, the noise testing that was conducted this week um, was not conclusive um, uh, councillors environmental health officers were not uh, able to take do testing at all the sensitive receptors which is the pattern um, it was also, there were some uh, problematic conditions on the site. I guess. I'm not sure that's the best way to put it, but um, the background noise was done while there was no wind occurring. Um, when the machinery were operating, the wind was blowing. There was also a number of people on site talking and children playing. Um, so the readings done during the day were not consistent. Um, the reading, we know we have not done readings at night. Um, uh, if, if there are concerns raised in the future by residents, that's something we can look at during the meeting to ensure compliance with, with the conditions. Remembering at night, uh, the potential impacts come down to um, uh, the owner going out on site to do the harvesting and returning at night, um, and the compressors from the refrigeration system on site. If he's not operating the, the actual meat processing, uh, the bone store, etc., at night, and that's when he operates during the day. Uh, so the, the compressor are on site, as you know, we heard it all the other day, it was similar to a full pump noise, um, so the expectation is it will not cause an issue at night. Uh, but nevertheless, we can take readings in the future to understand the um, Question if I may, yeah. Yeah, sure. uh, It's important that the full process is understood. If this was to be refused tonight, what would be the process going forward for the applicant? What? Yeah, uh, if, if the application was refused by council, um, the applicant has appeal rights to the Planning and Environment Court, uh, seeking that the court consider the matter afresh, um, including submissions made by residents. Um, and uh, through that process, there's a process whereby council would need to try to find experts to support their position and refuse it. Um, that may be difficult for the officer's recommendation. Um, the court will also order mediation between the parties and ultimately there will be a trial uh, to be held. Equally, if um, council chooses to approve the application or possibly may submit it, have the right to appeal to the Planning and Environment Court, so that would be lodged with the courthouse in, in Richardville. Um, it would be recommended that it be represented um, and a, a similar process is and if it was refused tonight, would the applicant and their legal team be using the planning scheme and the councillors, uh, the, the staff report as evidence to support their case? 
Yes. Um, so the court would consider the application against the planning scheme and make a decision about whether it is compliant with the scheme. So they would um, do their own assessment against the scheme provision. They would certainly have regard to officers and the position that we recommend with their approval and frequently would be considered. There's been one case, I think this term, where um, council has varied from a staff recommendation and um, we went to appeal and then our solicitor's advice was we recommended we settle because it's possible that because um, the council didn't follow staff recommendation that court costs may have been um, given against us. Um, is that something that would be in the consideration of the court, the fact that if council has gone against the, the, the recommendations of staff, it was deemed that they hadn't followed the funding scheme, that uh, that would be a grounds for an appellant to consider court costs? Um, there, there is that risk, I agree, and we have been advised before that we may be subject to cost cases against us, where we haven't followed good process. Um, it is very difficult for costs to be awarded against council, so suggesting the end that may not occur, but there is always that, that tension. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this? So far, Joe has spoken and Frank. Okay. And Brian. I think the the difficult part about this is the role of um, us as representatives of the community. And we know that the surrounding community is, um, ha many of them have concerns about this development and it's caused emotional stress. But our role in determining statutory planning applications is very clear in law. Our role is to represent the community's wishes as embedded in the gazetted NEPSA planning scheme. We don't have the luxury of taking grounds outside of what's allowed for within planning to determine an application. We don't have the luxury of uh, saying, well, I don't think it's a nice development. We have to say, does the development achieve the performance outcomes as outlined in the planning scheme? And even higher than that, an impact assessment, we can say, does it achieve the strategic intent of the planning scheme? And as the staff have reported, and as I mentioned on Monday, this development complies with the strategic intent of the planning scheme and has uh, put in place measures in the management of the operation to ensure it meets the performance outcomes for home-based business in rural residential. So in my opinion, the, the councillors must follow what is required of us under the law, which is to, in, to follow uh, the, the community's intent as adopted in the planning scheme. Thank you, this is a highly emotive issue. It's one where the community, some, many of who are here tonight, have provided significant feedback about their concerns, what they believe to transpire, what they have seen or been witness to, and projected their views to us via emails, via correspondence, face to face, and told us about the impact it's had on them. And I thank them for their time and their input, and I appreciate that this is a very sensitive issue. I attended both properties. The neighbouring property who were the most affected and the applicant's property. I thank both those residents for their time and outlining their concerns. Indeed, as I said, it's an issue that has divided the community. To make a fair, impartial decision, I must go on the evidence I have. That is my job. I must look to the Noosa plan. I must look to performance outcomes and I must assess the application, which is impact accessible against a whole planning scheme. And I must do this on tested evidence. What I saw and what I heard, the facts. We had to see as Councillor Wilkie for ourselves. I attended the neighbour who is directly affected. I found that it was hard to see. 
the visual amenity was difficult to see into the affected into the 82 Patterson. Again with the noise, and I can confirm I wasn't there at night and it was during the day, but it was difficult to hear. The increased trucks have been a concern. I am aware that it will be once a week. There are no deliveries and no on-site sales. There's no insulated trucks delivering goods to the business. The deer is transported at night and returns home between 12 and 3, once a week. There was a significant impact on any visual or noise amenity would be the applicant's indeed own home who would bear the brunt. I did not smell anything and there was no odour that I encountered. Now let's move to the planning scheme. Let's look at the staff recommendation and what we have before us. To comply with the scheme, the applicant must demonstrate that the proposal meets the applicable development code, including home-based business code, which includes performance outcomes and acceptable outcomes. To meet the code, the applicant must demonstrate that they either meet the performance outcome or the acceptable outcome. They are not required to meet both. That is the laws of the planning scheme. That is what we must assess this application on. That is what the court of law would look to and rule on. And as Councillor Stockwell said, we don't have the luxury to do anything else. So I believe, based on the evidence that I saw, I heard, and I smelt, that this, however difficult it is, this business does comply. I must make a decision, as I said, based on compliance with the Noosa plan. I must make a decision on the facts. Let me offer some additional balance. The decision today is squarely centred and based on the understanding the approval is limited to five deer and does not presume or authorise any variation to the existing process of approvals including expansion. As you've heard, a number of things can be taken in regard to action in the way of fines, the planning and environment court, or even jail time at worst. The cost of our decision tonight is hard and it's a difficult one, and we understand the community angst. But I would not be doing what I believe is the right thing, and I could not look at myself in the mirror with knowing it if I didn't make a decision based on the facts that I had before me. I believe that this decision is the right one at this point in time. I believe with the additions of Councillor Joe and Councillor Amelia that it gives increased certainty and comfort, if I can use that, I won't use that word, it gives increased and increased compliance requirements for the applicant. But this decision before us that we have complies, it's balanced and it's evidence-based. And I, in this case, I support the staff's recommendation. Today, we are determining whether this application, as assessed against the benchmarks laid out in the Noosa plan is an appropriate development for the location. This is not an appropriate business for this location and I will not support this application. One of the key outcomes of the planning scheme is that we preserve and protect resident amenity and we avoid conflicts from incompatible land uses. A meat processing facility on a rural residential property less than one fifth of the minimum size required by the NUSA plan for low impact industry does not meet this outcome. It is not, it is an incompatible land use. Patterson Drive is a rural residential estate. It's not an ag agricultural estate. It's not an industrial estate. It's a, not a rural community like Lake McDonald. We are talking small rural properties where neighbours live shoulder to shoulder. This is not a location, councillors, that is appropriate for a business of this nature or scale. Under acceptable outcome 9.2, it states in clear and unambiguous terms that properties less than four hectares in area, that home-based businesses 
do not include operations that would be otherwise defined as low impact industry. This is a low impact industry. And it impacts on the residential character and amenity of the zone. It does not comply with the Noosa plan and its incompatible land use. Talking a lot about law, courts, and compliance with statutory compliance. Councillors, I'm standing here today not as a lawyer, not as a town planner, and not as a council officer. I'm standing here as a councillor, as an elected representative of this community. I stand here because the community gave me a seat at this table so that I can use my voice to be theirs, to represent their interests, their viewpoints, and their expectations. This is my job, this is our job. The decision today should be concerned with the community's interest and the community's welfare, not just the interest of the applicant's development application. This is not an inappropriate home-based business in a rural residential area that is made up of small rural properties. Patterson Drive is a rural residential estate. It's not an agricultural estate. It's not an industrial estate. When residents bought their small rural blocks in this quiet rural residential estate, they did not expect that, that one day they would be living next door to a meat processing facility. I urge councillors that you reconsider your vote and refuse this application. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Um this, this has been a very challenging um, decision. I've been out, I have responded to the neighbours. I have um, been out to both the properties. I have tried to remain impartial and look at, um, be reasonable and balanced in my decision making. Um, I've taken into account the cost to the neighbourhood, the amenity. I have listened to what, what they have had to say. I've taken on board the recommendations of the staff and I've considered also the broader view to the community with regards to the cost and the future and where we're heading in the Shire. Um, it's a difficult decision that we have to deliver this evening. I am, however, confident that there is sufficient um, risk mitigation things in place that there will be checks and balances along the way to determine anything that impacts on this development can be addressed moving down the track in a reasonable manner to carefully consider all parties involved. Everybody I understand has made a huge investment into their homes, into their neighbourhoods, the applicant into the business and I acknowledge that um, that is a, this has been challenging. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. George, let's close. Yeah, look. I think councils will lose to. This isn't an easy job. But we have been charged with the job of upholding the planning scheme. And there are a number of times where I haven't agreed with the planning scheme. But again, yeah, this is the task that we've, we've been put in and elected to do. That planning scheme was one that was accepted by our community. And part of that was performance outcomes which this application was. It also enables rural uh, activities on rural residential properties. Uh, it also accepts home-based businesses of a scale. And this, according to the uh, assessment by staff, meets all of those. I've heard the concerns of the neighbours and, and, and I empathise, and I do sympathise. It's not an easy thing, but I believe that um, the permit condition added by Councillor Lauriston here will enable the applicant to show good faith that he can buy, uh, abide by all of these. Odour and noise are the enemy of this application. Odour is the enemy of any food preparation. It means something's wrong with the process if you get odour. So no food processing uh, service would want odour as part of their, part of their, uh, their, uh, of their operation. 
no noise. And uh, as the councillors were all concerned, and we heard the, the concerns of the uh, of the residents, we attended site. We did hear the band and we did hear the mincer operating, and it was very difficult to hear it anywhere outside of the insulated room because the insulated room is, a, is significantly thick to provide not only thermal insulation but also noise insulation. Uh, so the, 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 the rhymes and reasons to refuse this uh, 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 aren't there, but the ones to, to approve it are. And that's the reason and the basis upon which I base my, uh, my, my assessment and my judgment here today, put that forward. Again, we've added additional conditions there to address the concerns that were raised by residents and we've got 12 months now for both sides to actually see this in operation and see that it can meet and comply to the conditions that council has put to us. So for, that re for all those reasons, I will be supporting this. But I acknowledge the concerns that have been raised by the community and, uh, and wait to see the, uh, the outcome in 12 months' time. Thank you, Mr. Joe. We'll put the motion to a vote all in favour. Council Stockholder, Switch, Finzel, Wegner. Rocky Stewart against Councillor Lawrenceson. Motion carried. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Leo. Do we need the motion to go into? We may not have to. So I just need to speak here. Unless you want to be sure that it's confidential. Oh, okay. Uh, the, the second item. Um, direct to the ordinary meeting report is the appointment of the Chief Executive Officer Noosa Council. Um, there are confidential attachments associated with this report and we have Deb, our Director of Governance here. Um, if any council wishes to discuss anything contained in attachment two or three in regard to the actual contract or this person, we will be required to go into confidential session. If not, uh, we can probably, on the information we have before us in the ordinary report, um, maintain open openness there. Yeah. Um, Madam Chair, I'll move the staff recommendation. Thank you. I'll second that. Um, thank you. I do so on the basis of uh, the information provided, the process that has been undertaken, and I look forward to the opportunity of being able to make an announcement in due course. Thank you. So just a question on that for those who may be listening and interested. Um, Deb, um, when will we be announcing publicly the appointment? Um, the, um, before we can announce it publicly, the uh, contract has to be executed by both the Mayor and the um, successful candidate in this. So um, hopefully that will happen as soon as possible. So it is possible that that could happen tomorrow. I'll speak to this, and I, 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 what I am going to outline here is uh, what Deb has put in a very thorough report, and I thank her for all her hard work on this. She's worked very hard to get this, this contract executed. Um, the steps in regard to this process have been significant, an incredibly long, detailed and thorough process. There was originally on the 14th of July 2021, a request for a quotation, quotation for the procurement process went out. Uh, to manage the executive search and assessment process to secure a new CEO for Council. A number of recruitment companies applied and went through proper procurement process. Davidson rated highest and were awarded the tender. The managing partner and senior staff engaged with all councillors in the development of the success profile for the position, including the priorities for the new CEO that we as councillors collaboratively worked on. We engaged Mercer to undertake an independent remuneration review of the CEO position. A panel was formed comprising myself, the Deputy Mayor, former CEO of Mercer Council, Victor Bruce Davidson, and Real Gardner, a non-executive director and former financial services executive with 30 years experience at major ASX companies. The panel then interviewed the shortlisted candidates and recommended the preferred candidates. Psychometric testing was undertaken for shortlisted candidates. Referee checks were undertaken for top preferred candidates. A meeting with all councillors to review and discuss shortlisted candidates, interview outcomes, the preferred candidate and remuneration package was undertaken and pre-employment searches on the preferred candidate. 87 applications were received. The assessment of all applications and the identification of 13 candidates 
whom Davidson considered to be the most highly ranked against the selection criteria. The panel reviewed applications and shortlisted seven of the highest ranked candidates for interview on the 22nd of September 2021 and 16th of November 2021. Psychometric tests were conducted for the highest ranked candidates and professional referee checks were conducted for the top four candidates. The panel was unanimous in determining the preferred candidate for CEO position. On the 11th of October 21 and 29th of November 21, Davidson facilitated meetings with all councillors to provide an overview of the selection process and the details of shortlisted candidates and interview results. All councillors met with the preferred candidate on the 29th of November 2021 for a number of hours. All councillors were given the opportunity to speak with the preferred candidate and ask questions and all councillors were supportive of the preferred candidate. The preferred candidate brings a significant level of experience. I don't think I can say too much more. I'll <laughs> stick with the process. <laughs> I don't want to give it away. Um, but it, all I can say is we've gone through an incredibly thorough process. I mean, <laughs> they're the steps. No wonder Deb's tired, ready for a break. Uh, so I, I do want to thank Deb and the governance team um, for all their hard work in this. And I think um, if this is a positive way to end what's been a difficult year, and, and may we all move forward together in 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to add um, that I want to take this opportunity to thank and acknowledge our acting CEO, Mr. Larry Sengstock. Yes. Um, your leadership, guidance, patience, um, we thank you for. Yeah. Here, here. Thank you, Larry. Anybody else? Uh, oh, I'll, I'll close if I may. If nobody else is getting up. Uh, you've stolen the thunder, Councillor oh. Morrison. Uh, I too wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge the, uh, the large, huge shoes that uh, you've taken on and filled in the uh, early departure of our uh, our previous CEO and through the prolonged process that has undergone, uh, undergone this, Larry. And, uh, and you have been a guiding light, a shining light for all of us here and on. Very pleased that you're a, a part of our organisation going forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, to all the staff that have had to endure additional uh, additional work and uh, additional stress through this process as well, I'd like to thank you all. Because uh, working uh, without the appointed CEO for the future is uh, is a challenge. And uh, look, I do look forward to uh, when the announcement can be made. Um, it'll be a Christmas present for this council, the staff. And the organisation as a whole, that I hope that we uh, we can be uh, ho ho hoing uh, in the very very near future. Uh, I look forward to the mayor signing that document and getting it underway so that we can get it back as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, anyone else like to speak? No, I'll be spoken. Sorry, Nick Hart. I'll put Manitoba all in favour. That is unanimous. Thank you. We didn't have to go into close. Thank you, Deb. Uh, we have one submission to public question time. Uh, just a reminder that under our standing orders, no debate is allowed on these questions. The application cont is containing two questions is from Mr. Brian O'Connor. Mr. O'Connor, welcome. My first question this evening, Mayor, is that does NUSA Council adhere to this position in respect of parking at the moment? And I quote, the Noosa Council Traffic Study 2017-32 identified that while variations in parking demand occurred, overall Pomona has sufficient parking. The available parking outside the busy market period indicates that a high level of parking availability services exists during non-peak periods and, and, and is being provided by Pomona. And that there are no plans for further parking infrastructure in the 10-year capital works program for Pomona, unquote. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Based on results from the Noosa Council study, a traffic study in 2017 and the recent review of parking carried out in 2021, it's considered that there is sufficient existing parking supply to meet the demand for parking in the Pomona study area of 2031. When considering parking supply and demand across the study area, parking demand in Pomona does not currently exceed 75% of parking supply, therefore no immediate intervention is required. 
As such, there is no funds budgeted for car parking in Pomona in the 10-year capital program, as this aligns and reflects with our planning. We acknowledge that parking availability can fluctuate, particularly during busy periods, but from the information we have, there is no need for additional off-street parking in the area. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Larry. Um, Brian, um, I believe you have another question, and that is to our Director of Community Services, Kerry Contini, who will respond. Yes. Can Noosa Council please identify definitively the site, building, structure, or dedicated location where the people of Pomona can conduct commemorative services and stand or sit in solemn contemplation of those who gave their lives in wartime conflict to preserve our freedoms and Australian way of life. Thank you for your question, Brian. Um, Pomona has a number of locations which commemorate um, people who served in Israel as a result of um, war and conflict. Uh, that includes the Pomona Memorial School of Arts Hall and the Memorial Rotunda. Um, the Memorial Hall also includes the role of honour boards um, for the Pomona and Trafalgar districts, honouring those people who died in service um, in World War I. Uh, the Rotunda is located within Joe Bazo Park and so it is um, generally open freely for those people who would like to sit and um, contemplate those people on the memorial. And commemorative services on public land will be considered um, through our event application process. Thank you for your question. Thank you, thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Thank you, Kerry. Um, that brings us to the end of our agenda. As this is the last meeting for the year, um, I'd like to personally thank uh, Alinda and Pat for all their hard work. I'd like Absolutely. to thank um, yep, Kerry, Deb, Kim, Trent, Leo, Anthony, and all our exec team and acting exec team and people who have filled in. Uh, you guys have been terrific. Um, we're really so grateful for your support. And I'd especially like to thank Larry, uh, who has been a wonderful acting CEO. And I think the reason we weren't in such a hurry and we were comfortable with our, our weight was because we knew we were in such good hands. So thank you, Larry, for all your support. And thank you very much to all uh, my colleagues around the table. It's been a challenging year. No, no doubt there's more to come, but onward and upward to a bigger and brighter 2022. Thank you. I, I wish everyone all watching a very Merry Christmas, a safe and happy uh, holiday period. And as I said, may we all move forward together in 2022. Uh, I declare the meeting closed.